yet another cloud service? Yep. And it's something that radio stations will find useful every single day. Curtis Maycheck, the CEO of Cloudcast Software, is here with us, along with Chris Tobin and me. And we're talking also about AES67 and the practical side of making IP audio connections using this new technology. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Lavo and the Crystal Clear Virtual Radio Console. Crystal Clear is the console with a multi-touch touchscreen interface. By Direct Current Broadcast e-newsletter. Get Direct Current in your inbox every Thursday with technical pointers, putting you and your facility at an advantage. And by Axial Livewire Plus. Livewire Plus includes fully compliant AES67 audio over IP built in. Livewire convenience plus worldwide connectivity. Welcome in. It's time for This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about radio technology, everything audio from the microphone, like that one, <laughs> to the light bulb at the top of the tower and everything in between. And now that involves a whole lot of digital and internet. And that, we're going to talk about some of that today, a very cool application with our guest, Curtis Maycheck. Uh, I'm Kirk Harnack. I work for the folks at the Telos Alliance. So if you hear any bias that way, well, that's probably why I, I know a lot about their products. Uh, also with us, my co-host, is here, joins us from an undisclosed adult beverage location in the greater New York area. And it's Chris Tobin. Welcome in, Chris. Glad you're here. <laughs> Why, thank you. Yes, it is a, uh, it's a sports bar, but because of uh, state regulations, I can't say where, where I'm at. So it's across the street from a place that a family member is taking care of some things. So that's why I'm here. The manager was kind enough to let me just quickly jump in. And uh, my crazy spotlight uh, is what I'm using. And here we are. Hey, uh, w would you tell our audience briefly um, what gear that you're using to do this live TV remote? Sure. Uh, today, it's my MacBook. It is the uh, Audio-Technica USB microphone that's in my hand. I'm using a, a 4x3 LED light. I forget the brand name, but they're very popular. Uh, and a uh, C920 webcam Logitech. And today, I happen to be testing out their in-house Wi-Fi. The manager was good enough to let me use the corporate connection, not the guest Wi-Fi or the, oh. you know, the public Wi-Fi. So I'm hoping uh, during the course of this hour that this Wi-Fi will maintain its stability, at least for the last 40 minutes. Uh, speed, check, speed tests were looking good, and a few other things I was doing seemed to be stable. So we'll see what happens. Can you tell me, is this the kind of um, facility that would have an IT department, or is this guy just got so, you know, some internet coming in and somebody fairly smart you know, divided up into guest and company uh, you know, business uh, activities, uh, maybe t you know, two different IP ranges or something? He actually has uh, an outsourced company. He has an IT company that comes in and uh, specializes in sports arena, sports bars. Uh, ah. Yeah, sports bars. Okay. That's thing we call it. Yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. So you got s some assurance of, uh, of bandwidth. And that's something that we're, as broadcasters, yeah. we're always interested in what is, what is it like there in, in the real world? And, well, I bet you have a backup with you, don't you, Chris? I do have my uh, Verizon USB modem. Yes, that's my backup. And I actually have a wired drop I can access if I want to run up just to the wall and run a cable across, drop a, a, a kind of cover on the wire and prevent a trip hazard. I can do that too. So uh, we'll see how this Wi-Fi goes. I the installation looked really good. Yeah. The installation, they're using good. Cisco switches. It's Comcast yeah. business. Uh, yeah. What else? Not Comcast, what I'm saying. It's uh, Files. And uh, it looks good. So we'll see. Good. Okay. And that's something that we've, we've stressed here for some years as, as we as engineers are forced to do, you know, more remote broadcasts using uh, OPI, other people's internet, or maybe OPC, other people's connections. And the one thing that we found, and Chris and I have found this on the road several times, is you've got to have uh, an A plan and a B plan and maybe even a C plan. Chris and I were at a hotel in Las Vegas just this past spring and plans, as I recall, plans A and B didn't work. We had to go to Plan C, which worked fabulously. So that is correct. Always, always have several, yeah, several sources of internet, which typically are you know the local Wi-Fi, or see if you can prearrange to drag a wire somewhere. Uh, or uh, we had uh, both Chris and I had had Verizon uh, USB data sticks, and neither one of us were getting the kind of bandwidth that we needed. It was just awful, and which is unusual. And then I had a, a, a this T-Mobile phone, and I made a hotspot into it, and it happened to have you know about. Six or seven megs down and uh, three, four megs up, and that was just enough to get the job done. So, got to have, uh, got to have the plans. All right, uh, let's bring in our guest. And enough of this. Our guest here is a fellow that I've known for a while. He's he's been a friend of mine and uh, and a friend of, uh, of of Telos, my employer. And that's Curtis Maycheck. Curtis from Canada. Welcome in, sir. How are you? I am good. How are you? 
Terrific, terrific. Hey, what? How did we meet? What were the circumstances that we uh, started talking about technology? You remember? I think it was probably just um, through one of the Facebook groups because I know you're a part of uh, a number of Facebook groups, uh, some yeah. tech, uh, radio tech Facebook groups, as am I. And I think that was probably how it happened, where we just uh, we just started talking through uh, through the groups, and I, I was kind of interested in Telos products at the time, uh, specifically mm. some of the IP audio hardware, and uh, and from there I just kind of started talking to you more and more, and we've kept in touch. Well, good. Okay. And then we met in person at an NAB show, and uh, then at last spring's NAB show, here you show up with a booth and a product, and so you're taking your ideas and making them real for broadcasters. And that's we're going we're gonna to keep our powder dry for a minute here, but that's what we're going to talk about is this uh, uh, product and technology that you have developed. And of course, when, when, you, when you showed me the technology, I thought, well, duh, that just makes sense. But the thing is, you've done it. You've made it available, and that's where the rubber meets the road. It just you know, an, an idea is not that great, but take an idea, make it into something that people can actually use, uh, pay a little bit of money for, and get a real benefit from. That's that's where it comes comes in. So that's what we're going to be talking about that and a few other things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it'll be fun. All right, our show uh, this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by the folks at Lavo, L A W O Lavo. And I just spent some time with some folks at Lavo the, earlier this week. Uh, Lavo, you know, is the maker of the crystal clear virtual radio mixing console. And uh, they're also coming out with some new products for radio that have to do with virtualized radio. But the, the crystal clear console was a uh, first real entry into that. And, uh, you know, normally I read from a, from a script, and I, but I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the console and then uh, what we did this week. Uh, the, the virtual radio mixing console, crystal clear from Lavo, this is an idea where you have a one rack unit box. You can see it uh, well, just in the, in the picture there that was on the screen. A one rack unit box that has the DSP in it. It's the upper right hand corner of the, the big picture uh, next to the guy's finger there. That, um, that has all your audio inputs and outputs and power supply and uh, uh, Ethernet connection and then uh, a mic preamp and all that kind of stuff. It's a typical number of ins and outs. Uh, and it has the DSP mixing engine, but it also has the, um, uh, the ability to be controlled by an external uh, device, and that device is some software running on a Windows multi-touch touchscreen PC. And so it's a, this is not an expensive proposition when you're using off-the-shelf hardware, and those multi-touch screens are getting so good. So you, you can see you know, the guy's finger on the, on, the, on the screen there, that's touching a screen. It's a multi-touch screen, and they're so responsive now. Well, you find touch screens in lots of different applications, and so putting one into a radio console uh, just makes sense at this point. It gives you so much flexibility. And now that PCs are getting so powerful, they have so, so many MIPS just left over doing nothing, that now Lavo is, uh, is uh, showing off products that let you, once you get your level set, push that off to the side and just let AutoMix do the job. And then you can get into uh, controlling a phone system or codecs or an automation system on the same screen. And we'll be talking more about that in the weeks to come. Uh, from Lavo. Now, about what we did uh, this week uh, in, um, in Los Angeles uh, with AES-67. Uh, uh, the folks at Ravenna have been part of this, and Lavo uh, is tightly tied in with Ravenna. Uh, so we actually connected uh, an Axia system, Lavo system, um, and a, a system using Dante, two systems using Dante, all together, uh, and well, one using QLAN as well. And, it, and they all shared audio just fine, just perfectly clear uh, high-resolution linear audio. So I uh, just want to point out that the folks at Lavo with Ravenna running in their products uh, gives you that AES-67 connectivity as Ravenna uh, is, uh, is compatible with uh, AES-67. Check out uh, the folks at Lavo and, and the whole stuff there. You can contact Bill Bennett. He is the, um, uh, the U.S. representative for Lavo, and he'll be glad to tell you all about the crystal clear virtual radio mixing console. For more information, check out the website. It's Lavo, that's L-A-W-O dot com. L-A-W-O dot com. And just find the, under products, find Crystal Clear. Thanks to Lavo for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Hey, guys, I do want to touch on this for just a minute here. This um, uh, thing I got to do earlier this week, and that was um, uh, Philip Kalani at Yamaha in, um, in, uh, uh, what city was that? Uh, Buena, Buena Park, California, uh, invited me and a few others to come to Yamaha and uh, have a look around, but also set up a video demonstration 
of different brands of audio consoles all connected together using this AES67 standard. And uh, uh, Chris, I got to tell you, you know, I've been talking about AES67 for a while. We've had guests on the show, uh, Greg Shea in particular from from uh, Axia, talking about it. And um, I got to tell you though, I've been faking it a little bit because I actually had zero actual hands-on experience making it work. Every time I'd get to a trade show, the support guys from the Telos Alliance already had it working. They already had, you know, Genelec speakers hooked up, or they had it. We had it, our stuff hooked up with a a uh, Lavo or Ravenna uh, system already, and I I never typed any numbers in, so I got to do that, and it was an experience. Chris, I, I don't suppose you've had any opportunity to play with AES sixty seven yet, have you? Only at the Media Alliance booth at NAB, and ah. that was about. It. Yeah, no, I have not had a chance. So I've talked to a lot of folks who are working on it and, and uh, various uh, implementations taking place across the industry, but that's about it. No, I'm hoping later this fall to be able to do some more stuff. Well, and, and that was kind of my point. Manufacturers uh, have just, uh, well, not just, I mean, over the past two years have been slowly bringing products out that are either compliant or compatible with AES-67. And, and I, I should mention the difference there. Some um, products out there are compatible. That means they'll send and receive audio, but you may have to go to a little extra work. Other products are compliant, and that the, the intention there is that means that they check all the check boxes for compliance uh, with AES-67. And then some people uh, are going beyond just simple compliance. They're, they're adding you know, plenty of, of more features to it. So it's interesting to see this move along. Now, I got to tell you, for, for manufacturers, most manufacturers, uh, this is not always their highest priority. You know, they've got their own product lines to work with and worry about. Uh, I'm sure the folks at Ravenna and Dante and QLAN and, and, uh, and Livewire as well, you know, we've all got things to do to make our own systems work. But then we, everything that, they're, uh, that we're always looking to make sure that what we're doing doesn't uh, break compatibility or compliance, but actually, you know, works toward that. And it was neat to see these different systems working together. Um, uh, it was a little bit, let's see why, you know, a little bit of it was point and shoot, just or point and click, you know, uh, but not all of it was. Some of it, gee, do we type in the multicast IP address to, to make this work, to subscribe to a given channel? Oh, that brand over there doesn't use the same range of multicast IPs that this brand over here does. So we have to, let's manually put in a multicast IP uh, over there so that we can pick it up over here or vice versa. And then um, uh, to connect up with the, with the uh, Dante stuff, which is AES67 compatible, uh, it took a little extra piece of software. The guys at Ravenna have this for free that you can download. And it is a, uh, an advertisement converter um, to, to help other systems see the Dante streams on the network. Uh, and perhaps vice versa. So it's, it's, not, it's not all point and click just yet. A little bit of it is. But, what, you know, once you figure it out, and I didn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't so hard to figure out. It just, you know, a couple engineers chat about it. Oh, yeah, try this. Try. That's it. That makes it work. Um, so anyway, that was my experience, Chris. And I, I hope uh, at some point you get some similar experience, too, to, to hook up uh, otherwise incompatible systems. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, there's a lot going on. I mean, when I was up at the CCB two weekends ago in Canada for the Central Canada Broadcast Engineering Conference, uh, there was a lot of talk of IP, both in the audio and the video world. And now I was talking to several radio station owners about mending, mel mending, melding the two together by being on location, doing a regular radio broadcast, say, at a local uh, establishment, and now adding a video component. And it's interesting how a lot of folks still aren't sure how to treat it. They keep thinking it's like a, it's totally separate from what you're doing. And it's like, wow, but it's all IP now. We were talking uh, how to integrate it all. And they were fascinated by the fact that I said, if you can guarantee yourself about, uh, about nine megabits up and down at a location, you can do the audio and the video at 720p or even 1080, but 720p and have a nice connection and make something happen. So it's, it's fun. And AES 67 just adds to the toolbox to let you do more things. Seems that the next uh, alphabet soup buzzword coming along uh, works with AES67. I haven't figured all this out yet, but I know that the folks at my employer, at, at TELUS Alliance, are taking great note of this, and that is the uh, Networked Media Open Specifications, or NMOS. So there's a website about that, nmos.tv, and this is more for TV workflow, but uh, 
Enmos may do even more to help bring uh, advertising and management to the world of AES 67. So uh, I think it was, a, it was a pretty big deal to get all the manufacturers to at least agree on one set of, of, uh, of audio uh, format standard for AES 67. And it, it wasn't a shoe in for any of the proponents who were who participated in that. Um, you know, TELUS Alliance was a, uh, a founding uh, a member of, the, of, of that working group at AES. Uh, so, uh, you know, TELUS, uh, Livewire had to make some changes to make that work. Uh, but so did everybody else. So, hey, I, I, I didn't mean to forget you, Curtis. Curtis, have you gotten to play any with uh, with uh, AES 67? I know you've got a live wire system right there in front of you. I do, I do. I've got a live wire system uh, in the apartment here. But no, I haven't actually touched the AES 67 stuff at all. And it's one of those things that um, I keep trying to get my hands on it. I wanted to tr uh, play around a bit uh, at NAB when I was there in April. Uh, but I haven't had it. I wasn't able to break away from the booth. Um, but yeah, no, I had. I really want to try it. Um, it's. It just seems like. It seems like we're moving towards a way uh, where everything can start to talk to each other, and it's really cool as a broadcast engineer. That uh, that we're going to be able to have things that are talking to each other and uh, talking to each other very efficiently. So. You'll be able to have, um, you know, a a certain board, and then you could have another board in another room, but have those networks be together. That's just incredible technology that um, that is going to save a lot of money in the industry, uh, as well as um, as well as make everything work just a little bit better together. Uh, especially the no. money thing. I think mm -hmm. that's a really cool thing because you, you know, could have an existing facility that you're expanding and add more to it from a different uh -huh. manufacturer if they're making better products at the time. Uh, that's a very good point. And I think, I think another point that AES 67 brings about, and this to, to us at, uh, at Axia, this is probably, and I think it's true for the other manufacturers as well. Uh, you know, I was out there uh, fogging any mirror that, that you know, that, that uh, <coughs> excuse me, if, if somebody fogged a mirror, I'd talk to them, right, about, about audio over IP. This goes back 12 years ago. And uh, sure, at first, a lot of skepticism about audio over IP, and, and, and deserved. You, know, you need to examine this kind of technology before you throw your broadcast facility onto it. Um, but what AES-67 does is it helps customers who have not gone over to audio over IP yet feel more confident in their decision. Because if they choose something that turns out um, to, be, to, to not have the entire universe of what they want at least there is a standard to talk to other stuff. So if you start out, let's say you start out with Axia and Livewire, and then you discover, but you know what? I really don't want Telus Codex. I really want somebody else's codex, but I'd like to talk to them with AES-67 or with some, some standard. Now you can't. Now there's AES-67. So if there's somebody else's product you like better, you can use that and at least have that connectivity there. And, and that I believe that affords confidence for people who are still not on the IP audio bandwagon. Now they can look and see that, you know what? I think we can step forward a bit more confidently now. We're not likely to make a mistake that's going to be a pig in a poke. It's true. It's absolutely true. And I think that the, um, the IP audio bandwagon is, uh, is something that a lot of people have jumped on now. But um, the biggest concern is with making that right choice off the bat. You know, you go to NAB and you see a dozen or half a dozen different very good manufacturers of audio IP products and uh, when you put all those manufacturers together and you're able to make them work together and talk together and I saw some of the photos uh, from both the Yamaha trip that you were uh, doing there as well as uh, the other stuff it's just really cool that um, that everything can talk to each other you won't have to replace you know if you spend a uh, hundred grand on a bit of a facility and then down the road you want to you decide that maybe that was um, that that stuff isn't what you want, and uh, there might be something that works a bit better for you. Well, you don't have to scrap everything. You don't have to start from scratch again. Uh, you can just expand and build on what you already have uh, to to fix your compatibility issues and to fix your uh, your every, every to fix everything that you're um, all the problems you're having. So yeah, it's really cool that um, that all this is finally starting to become a thing because you know there were so many digital audio standards and IP over audio standards that now we're able to um, just kind of have one that connects everything together. While I was uh, there at Yamaha, uh, and I hadn't gotten a chance to play with these other devices yet, hands-on you know, uh, at any of the previous trade shows. So here I am literally 
setting up AES67 for the very first time. And um, uh, I had the benefit of being able to call a couple of our support guys at, at Telos who actually had done this before. And one thing I noticed is that um, there is a, a member of this AES67 uh, called Archwave. And Archwave makes a, a line of, uh, of boards called AudioLAN. And the AudioLAN uh, boards, this is, for example, what Genelec is using in their, uh, 80, I believe it's the 8430 uh, speakers um, that, uh, that offer... Uh, IP connectivity, and so it, it has this extra little board in there, um, and this board uh, you discover it typically using Bonjour. So my my uh, my MacBook uh, found that easily. Actually, the way you find it uh, is you open a browser, and uh, you, you look in the manual that came with the Genelec speaker, and you just go to a URL that includes um, the last six digits of the MAC address of that speaker. So you look at the back of the speaker, you make note of the string, uh, the you know, the text string there, the model number dash uh, last six of the MAC address, and you just type that into your browser, uh, and bam, uh, using Bonjour, it finds it, and there you, now you've discovered the IP address if there's DHCP, or you actually don't have to have an IP address uh, to to talk to it uh, using the method that I, I just said. I don't understand quite all about that networking. I just know that, wow, it worked. It actually worked. So. Uh, then when you bring up this interface, this audio land inter interface, that's where you can put in, uh, you know, the uh, either the uh, uh, multicast IP address of the stream you want to pick up. And it, being a speaker, a speaker can't really play stereo, not, you know, not an individual speaker. So you choose if you want stream one or stream two of a given stereo stream or the AES67 standard also allows surround sound streams. So you can actually go one through eight on that, on that stream selection as to which stream that you want to pick up of a given uh, multicast uh, IP uh, stream that's, that's an AES67 stream that's on the network. Or you can, you can um, copy and paste in uh, an SDP file. Uh, that's a session description protocol file. And that tells the speaker all, or tells the audio land board in the speaker uh, all about uh, what it's going to pick up. So if if uh, if the stream isn't um, standard or compliant in some way, the SDP can help it. You know, determine exactly. Hey, what do I do with with the stream? How many bits is it? What's the sample rate? All that's contained in in the SDP. Also, what's the source of clock on the network? Because I want to make sure that I, the speaker, is using the same source of clock. So it, it, I learned a lot, and it's it's pretty cool, a little techy, but it's no harder to learn than anything else that we do. Hey, it's Chris Tobin. Audio is, Land, oh. I was just going to say, yeah. if Audio Land is bringing those boards, um, if they're publishing those boards and those boards are becoming uh, something that is that they're selling and that they are providing to manufacturers and, and becoming more and more things, we're going to get more and more devices that, uh, that are AES67 compatible uh, yeah. and yeah. that work with our existing IP audio network. So it's going to be really cool to be able to see all that stuff uh, and what the manufacturers are bringing to uh, um, IP over audio. Like, it'd be cool to see some of the mic processors have built-in uh, um, IP over, or audio over IP, rather. That would be so cool to see. And I think we're going to see more and more of that as, uh, as the technology develops. I think that uh, this audio land boards, uh, the, the, this two or three boards, there's reference designs, and I, I think you can either you know, make your own based upon a reference design or, just, or buy one from them. Um, anyway, hey, uh, Chris Tobin, I'm not sure when you, when you uh, uh, pop back into the conversation. I was telling about you know, this audio land board from Archwave and how, hey, this looks like a really nice interface to, to use, to discover, and to set up a, a piece of equipment. You know, a speaker doesn't have a place to put an IP address into it, right? So That's true. Uh, That's true. The, the, the Genelec speakers had this audio land board, and it's discovered using Bonjour, and uh, bam, it just, it, just, it just worked. I liked it. Yeah, I actually was talking to a friend of mine who was doing something with some IP. He called, what do you call it? I have some IP speakers. How do I use them? I'm like, uh, well, give me the model number first. <laughs> I'm assuming there's no LCD screen or a keyboard? No. Okay, most likely an application needs to be on a computer, on a network that you're going to plug the speaker into. Oh, or does it plug into another device like the amplifier that might be running Dante or something? Oh, it was an interesting conversation. It was the first time I had somebody ask me about IP speakers. So to your, you know, to your talking about the, the, the bonjour and all the discovery and everything else, it's something new for everybody. This, these Genelec speakers, and, and I'm, not, uh, uh, I'm not totally familiar with them, but I, I know that 
before they came out with IP in them, through using this this uh, Archwave Audio Land board, uh, they uh, Genelec has their own, I think it's proprietary networking technology for setting speakers up. So um, these speakers actually had three RJ45 jacks on them. Uh, they had the one for the Audio Land board. That's the that's a regular Ethernet. And then they had two more that were RJ45s, but again, I don't think that they're real Ethernet, but they use Cat5 cables, and they connect to a little uh, hardware module about the size of a small router uh, that is made uh, for or by Genelec. It's branded Genelec. And, you, and then you run an app on your PC. So if you want to set up stereo or even surround speakers for a given room, Genelec has that facility. I don't mean to make this an ad for Genelec. I just, I just was really intrigued by all this. You, you download and run this app on your PC or, or Mac. They have a Mac version. Um, and then it's, there's a USB cable from your computer to this Genelec uh, uh, little box. And to this box connects a little reference microphone uh, or two microphones. I think you can put two there if you want. And then a LAN cable goes from the box to one speaker, and then it loops through and goes to the next speaker and the next speaker. And you, this is just temporary. So you can drag these speakers on the floor if you want to. And then uh, uh, it has a setup routine that uh, uh, runs tones and it, you know, pink noise and all that stuff. And and uh, it can auto adjust your speaker setup for your room. We didn't have time to go through that, but I did play with the software and. That was pretty amazing. And you know, that may be old news for some people watching the show, but um, I found, found it pretty intriguing that now these Genelec speakers have not one, not two, but three RJ45 jacks on, on them. How about that? That's crazy when you think about it. But times are changing. It's fun. I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, I, hey, uh, Curtis, I didn't mean to, to put this off. Let's, let's jump into the uh, subject that we're here no to talk, talk to you about. And that is using uh, IP audio in a bit of a different way. So at the uh, NAB show in the spring, I'm uh, walking around uh, our corner of, of the room there, uh, where, close to where Telos was, and I saw this booth that was this beautiful bright green, and it said, <laughs> Broadcast Logger. Why don't you, you uh, tell, that tell us... green is my favorite color? <laughs> Apparently so, yeah. Why don't you tell us about Broadcast Logger and uh, what it does, and then we'll uh, jump into, you know, what gave you the idea to do this? Yeah, for sure. Um, so basically what Broadcast Logger is, is uh, a company I started um, back in college. It was a college project that, um, that I, I kind of took to the next level. Uh, but what it does is it's, it reinvents kind of the audio logger that you would have in a radio station right now. So if you've got, um, if you've got a, a logger that uh, is recording everything that goes to air and it might have a skimmer aspect to it that's uh, grabbing your mic tallies as well, um, and, uh, and then it's storing that on a hard drive in your facility. Well, what we do is we take that entire process and we put it up in the cloud. Now, not actually the recording. The recording's done locally um, through a little application, and then that audio is sent up to, uh, to our cloud platform. Uh, we log the audio. We log the mic tallies through that local application as well. We're also grabbing um, the automation metadata, so everything that comes out of your automation system uh, gets sent to our platform as well. And when you log in on the back end, you have this really great, easy-to-use platform. Uh, you can access it on your phone. You can access it on uh, on a computer, and uh, and you can then search through those logs by the uh, audio or the song titles, the cart numbers, whatever metadata you're setting to us instantly becomes searchable, uh, as well as by the jock that was uh, live. And you can skip through the audio, find what you're looking for really easily. And because it's cloud-based, it's all decentralized, so that uh, if you're if you've got uh, some guy in, uh, in, on the west coast of the country, he's able to access those logs anytime uh, the same way that somebody on the east coast or someone in Europe would. Um, it's, uh, it's very easy. You just log in through the platform and then everything's, uh, everything's there. And uh, because of that, it makes it easy to use. It sounds like um, you, you could have a program director or a consultant or, hey, my radio stations, uh, for a couple of them, we still use an outside consultant to actually schedule our music. And um, uh, this way, that person could go, uh, you know, listen and check and make sure it was it was getting done right or things weren't getting dropped or, or skipped. Um, I think it's, a, you know, uh, look, on the one hand, a person could just record the station's stream all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know how, but maybe you could, well, there are, uh, there are recorders out there that would also record, if you will, the metadata that came in along with the stream. So you you could do that, but you've you've solved that. It's done, but you also can embed and record when mics are open and closed, and that helps 
that makes it more efficient for a program director or anybody to go back and listen to the right spots in the logged audio. Exactly. Uh, you can take um, a mic tally out of the uh, out of out of the board, or uh, whether it be through just like a USB GPIO device, or whether it actually be through um, some sort of a live wire or uh, Wheatnet driver or an IP audio driver. We can actually take those uh, tallies and those GPIO cues and log them with the audio, so that when you're going back into the platform later, you can kind of skip through very quickly. Or let's say you need to do a quick podcast of the show, and you want to grab all your breaks. Um, you just select all the, you just click, kind of go through the log, click on each of the breaks as you see them and hit export. And the, the software, because it's cloud-based, will actually um, do all that audio cutting on the server side. Uh, so it'll cut everything down. It'll present it to you in the format you've selected, whether that be uh, a WAV file, whether that be an AAC file for web, uh, or whether that be an email. Maybe it's uh, an emailed link to a client if you want to send them a recording of all, their ad of all the ads that went to air. It's really um, flexible that way. Okay, wow. So uh, um, uh, let's walk through the, the mechanics of this a bit. On, on the one hand, um, I'll tell you what, th these radio stations I have in Mississippi, we've, we have just blossomed, exploded into so many PCs running around. I, I really need to learn something about, and we need to have money for, um, uh, virtual machines because we sure could benefit from that. We got so many used refurbished Dells around the place that we're having trouble finding rack space for all this stuff. I'd like to reduce the amount of stuff in my station, and that's kind of one benefit for putting this in the cloud. Hey, whenever, you know, th th we're getting more comfortable with cloud. Whenever I snap a picture, right, with this Android phone, where does it go? Google Photos. The I don't cloud. have to worry about it. it. Yeah, it goes to the cloud, which is really just somebody else's computer. And Exactly. But, but it's there, and I have more trust in Google's ability to maintain servers and storage than I have my own, right? I mean, I've well, here at my house, I've got photos on probably eight different hard drives scattered about on the network and hooked to different computers. Thankfully, when Google Photos became available, I took a day of my, t of my life and just marked all these pictures that I'd been taking over the last 15, 20 years. And they all, you know, over a few day period, they all went to the cloud. Now they go aut automatically. Um, point is, I'd like to eliminate hardware on site and just have what I need, what I really need, and have... People like you store the stuff where I can get to it and, and search it and get, to, get it if I need to. So what, what hardware do I need? I, I, got, I imagine there's still a computer of some kind, a lightweight computer, to do the encoding and sending uh, up to your place. Yeah, if you've got um, any, sort of, uh, any sort of existing utility computer, as long as it's running Windows, you can install our application. And it, it does, it's very lightweight. It does not need a lot of uh, power. It doesn't need a whole lot of juice, if you will. You just kind of um, have it sitting in the background on a computer that, um, that is existing in your facility. Uh, you, most rack rooms have at least one Windows computer. So as long as it's got a sound card with a program audio feed in and, uh, and it's connected to the network so you can pick up those mic tallies, you can pick up uh, the metadata, uh, or, or it can be picked up or it can hit the Internet. Uh, then it's good to go um, because it kind of just does everything for you in the background and it's very lightweight because all it is is a, a, an hour-long recording that's being pushed up and um, pushed up to the cloud at, at the end of each hour. Okay, so it's, it's one, one hour file segments, each one containing the metadata for what got played and even contact closures for when, when mics were, were opened and such. Um, it actually does, it, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll explain it real quick, it actually doesn't yeah. even hold the metadata in that file. Um, mm. All that the application is doing is recording that metadata. The metadata is record um, the store. The metadata is stored, sorry, on our servers in a database. Uh, so we keep a separate database of that metadata, and then we line them up um, on the on the uh, on the platform so that everything uh, is uh, all lined up really well. And when you click on play, it jumps to the right part in the audio that it knew it was recorded at, and it can do this off off site too. So if you've got your uh, audio recording. On what at one spot, uh, you can actually record the metadata out of the automation directly, even if that even if that's in a different facility somewhere else. You mentioned, uh, of course, sound card. That's the way that we we traditionally have gotten audio into and out of, of a computer. And I, I really don't like sound cards that much because I found a better way. <laughs> that's an IP audio Neither driver. Neither do I. I well, I've got <laughs> I've got an entire uh, IP audio here. This this mic is going into uh, a board, and it's all IP audio from there. What? Really? Oh, that's right. You, you've got an Axia, what, a console there, right? Oh, look at that. <laughs> it is. 
How about it? Yeah. And then up so and then up oh, at, that's way at, too at, high. There we go. Let's at, fix that. And then at, at GFQ you're going through another audio over IP console. Happens to be an, an Axio there too. So so on a computer you could run an IP audio driver. I think earlier you, you, you mentioned briefly that it could be a, a Wheatnet driver, uh, it could be an Axia driver. Uh, and then as uh, I, I'm, I'm, I know that in the future, the Axia IP audio driver will also do AES-67. So as we talked earlier, you'll be able to, uh, you know, if you don't have an Axia system, you could still use an Axia driver and bring it in with AES-67, thereby eliminating, again, more cables, more hardware, and, uh, and just have a really lean system there. At, at my stations, I've got one PC that is streaming uh, four stations, three publicly, one privately, just for confidence. Plus, it's also monitoring four, five transmitters for audio. It's monitoring five receivers for audio. And there's all that does that is an extra network card, literally a $15 network card hooked to the live wire network at my stations. And I bring all that audio in that way. I could just add one more program yours to that and, uh, and and bring it up. Hey, how do you handle multiple stations? Do you run multiple instances or how does that work if I have? Yeah, you just install it in separate folders. So you just take the okay. same installer, run it three or four times in different folders, and uh, and you're good to go from there. You, it, 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 makes it, uh, it makes it really easy to do it all from one machine. Gotcha. Um, Chris Tobin, I, I, I don't know if you've heard about... Uh, Curtis's company. We really we hadn't talked about this before the show. Um, no, no, I didn't hear about the company, but I did look up the link and uh, look at stuff. This is very impressive, very, very nice. I like it. I, I really like the. You know, of course, I'm I'm getting to be. I'm, I'm getting curmudgeonly, right? I'm getting. Let's get less hardware in our radio station. And if I can pay a little fee to have it done offline somewhere else, let somebody else worry about the maintenance. Fine. Uh, I'd, I'd rather do that in a lot of cases, and I think this is going to be one of them. Um, uh, I also like the remote, the, the access from anywhere, because you could have, you know, as radio stations, unfortunately, have to become, you know, uh, in many cases, more more centralized in their operation. You may have a program consultant here or there. You may have a national advertiser that, that uh, you know, you, you want to get them easy access to hear that their spot ran or whatever it may, it may be. Um, your, your thoughts on that, Chris? Makes, no, it makes total sense. I think it's pretty cool. I don't see why not. Um, the less... You know, the less you do with these things, the hardware, the more you do in the IP and the, uh, what you call the, the virtual. That I, I just, it's really easy. It's, it's, I'm not, you can never, you don't have to be a curmudgeon anymore. You could be actually somebody of a futurist. <laughs> uh, Curtis, what, what kind of bit rates are we looking at? If I wanted to store audio of a high enough quality to go back later and actually maybe produce bits from the morning show. Could I do that? Put it back on the air. Yeah, absolutely. We've got uh, we store everything using the AAC audio codec, uh, and we can go all the way. Kind of our standard that we do um, is uh, 64 kilobits, which is great for web, great for podcasting. Um, we can go all the way up to 320, which is great. Uh, so you can have a really high quality audio that um, you can reuse. And uh, I will mention this too, because I th this always opens up eyes when I say this is we've designed the platform to be really easy. And what's cool about that is um, it's not just for the programmers and the producers anymore. Uh, it's not just for the people uh, that would typically have accessed that audio in the past. But now you can um, you could run this. You could you could give this. Uh, you open up the access to your sales team or uh, to the promotions team, and the sales guys, if they can go through, see all these spots that ran, they can provide better customer service when a client requests um, requests the audio from their ad because it's automatically it's it's there. They can just kind of search for it and find it very quickly, and you don't need to have that salesperson going back to um, back to programming and asking for the audio and then programming having to find some time to cut it down and um, yeah. because there's no mic tally associated with that they have to find the time in that it went to air in uh, the traffic system and in the uh, paper logs or the digital the text logs they have to go match that up with the audio it just saves a lot of time um, and it I, I it kind of I, I mentioned earlier that it started as a college project and uh, that's kind of what it came out of was it was I was spending too much time trying to find stuff in the logger uh, because we were looking we, we had ran some podcast style shows that didn't have mic tallies associated that were pre-produced and we needed to pull out that audio all the time and uh, it seemed dumb that I was kind of going through these 30 minute file segments looking for the audio uh, when 
I could just write something that uh, that popped up uh, that popped it up on the screen and, and jumped right to where I was looking for. You, you mentioned earlier about the ability to easily um, uh, pop this pop the audio you want into a podcast. And I got to tell you, that's a workflow that I'm not really familiar with. So when we come back from this quick break, uh, I want to talk both to uh, Chris, because I, Chris, I would imagine your stations that, that you're working with now uh, probably do a fair amount of this, where they're taking uh, original content that they produced and making it available online later on. Um, we don't do that at our, at our commercial stations right now, and I'm a bit interested in finding out some of the, the ways that this works and, and how... Um, broadcast logger can can make this work uh, even more easily, especially with the uh, export to SoundCloud. Uh, you're listening or watching to This Week in Radio Tech, episode 320. I'm Kirk Harnack, along with uh, Chris Tobin and our guest Curtis Maycheck from Western Canada. We'll find out more about where, where Curtis is in, uh, in just a minute. Our show is brought to you in part by the folks at the TELUS Alliance. And you know, they're doing something else that is really a service to those of us in the broadcast community. Got a little short video here to tell you about it. Let's take a look. in the paper today, is there? Yeah, not much. Seems tough to stay informed, you know? Like we're missing out on stuff. Important stuff. Yeah, feels like week old news. Yesterday's stories. Half the tech stuff in here seems out of date by the time I see it. What Kurt doesn't know is, I'm way ahead of everyone else around here. Every Thursday, I get this newsletter in my email. It's direct current. The folks at the Telos Alliance publish this. What Joe doesn't know is, I keep one step ahead of the radio guys in this market. Every Thursday, I get direct current from the folks at the Telos Alliance. It's a free newsletter about radio engineering, audio, streaming, studios, everything. Thursday afternoons, we have our department head meeting. I look like a genius, thanks to the knowledge, updates, and advice in direct current. Sometimes, I wonder if I should tell Kirk about direct current might help him out. I wonder if I should let Joe in on my secret. He could use a little help sometimes. Mm, nah. Get direct current in your inbox every Thursday. Read profiles of engineers and newsmakers in the broadcast community. Get technical pointers putting you and your facility at an advantage. Important industry news and views. Plus, you'll be up to date on Telos, Omnia, Axia, and Zipstream products. It's all here in the Direct Current newsletter. Subscribe online at telosalliance.com slash direct current. That's telosalliance.com slash direct current. Thanks a lot to the Telos Alliance for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And Direct Current, if you're not getting it, man, you, sh you should. Good stuff in there every week. In fact, I get Thursdays the day that uh, it typically comes out. So, um, yeah, I picked, picked up a bug, I think, on the way back from IBC. So we're talking with uh, Curtis Maycheck uh, of Broadcast Logger. And uh, Curtis, what's the full name of your company that you're the CEO of? Uh, so, yeah, uh, the company name is Cloudcast Software Incorporated. So um, the idea there being that Broadcast Logger is kind of one part of what could be uh, a bunch of uh, tools for radio stations that are kind of all based in the cloud. And, uh, and that's kind of the plan moving forward is not just to offer broadcast logger, but to al also offer um, a bunch of different things for radio stations. Got you. Um, is, uh, did, did Chris Tobin get back yet or has he still stepped away? I didn't say yet. Guess he still stepped away. Okay. So um, this idea of taking original content and turning it into a podcast available online, this is really popular with a lot of stations. We're not doing it yet at our stations. Uh, we probably should be, but, uh, but we're not yet. Uh, Curtis, how does this work? What does a station do to conveniently take uh, either a whole show, maybe you do a whole talk show, medical show, meet the mayor, that kind of thing, a round table, or maybe you've got some clips from the morning show that you want to have available. Uh, you know, on, you'll link them on social media. You want them available online. Talk to me about how Broadcast Logger makes that easy peasy. Uh, so typically right now, if you were to uh, want to do that, you would be able to grab the audio off your skimmer, uh, take it into a multi-track audio editor, put some, uh, drop some stuff in, in the middle and, uh, and, and be able to uh, publish it uh, you know, fairly quickly because you've got those mic tallies. Now, if you didn't have the mic tallies or it was a voice tracked show, for example, you wouldn't be able to do this. Uh, what you can do with Broadcast Logger is uh, just go into the platform 
And uh, there's like a nice little convenient playlist of everything that went on the air, music, uh, spots, the IDs, as well as the, the uh, mic tallies and the voice tracks as well. So you just select the ones you want. Uh, you can preview them right in the platform. And there's an export button. What's really cool is the export tool we have allows you to add those little splitters and breakups uh, that you would typically hear in a podcast uh, of, an, of a radio show. So you might have a a piece of audio that you've uploaded into the platform that is your intro. You might have a piece of audio that's your extra. And then you can take those, uh, those audio, or you can take those pieces of audio and put them online um, with one button. So you just select your, uh, the bits you want. You select your intro, your extra, maybe something that splits up each of the pieces. And it'll create a single file. It'll actually even send it all the way to SoundCloud for you. If you use SoundCloud, uh, we tie in with SoundCloud's API to push that audio directly from our platform to SoundCloud. It makes it super easy to, to publish that audio and to get it onto Facebook and to get it onto your website uh, to be shared. Uh, Facebook, if, um, if you've noticed, Facebook recently has been really pushing that uh, engaging content. Their algorithm favors uh, engaging content that is yeah. in a multimedia form. It's not just an image or text. Um, if you've got yeah. audio, if you've got a video on Facebook, you're going to actually do a lot better uh, with, that, um, with that audio. So we just make it easier to take that uh, stuff from your show, repackage it, repurpose it, and put it back online um, to, uh, to reuse. Okay, cool. I, I, you said something that intrigued me, and that is you can easily, I guess you might uh, call it, you know, top and tail. You can you well, you, you drag in and l let's say you've got some morning show bits, and you've got the you've got the raw bits available <clears throat> uh, in in you know on your interface. But I want to I want to open every bit with you know earlier this morning on the Jamie and Jody show, uh, and and then it leads into this bit. So I can drag that in and then have that cluster of you know in intro content outro published to soundcloud yeah exactly you just kind of drag in that intro and have it uh, selectable in the audio in the platform you upload everything you need and it's all in there and then you can just kind of create a list of um, what you want to hear so you want to hear that um, intro then you want to hear this piece of audio and then you want to hear or this clip from the morning show then you want to hear this then you want to hear this clip from the morning show uh, then you want to hear the outro and then you just hit export to SoundCloud and within about three minutes uh, it appears on your SoundCloud platform um, our server does all the cutting our server does everything you can kind of preview uh, preview it in the platform but once once you hit send to SoundCloud it just does all the work for you uh, so you don't have to cut everything down together. You don't have to. Um, you don't have to have a producer that's putting that together. Your morning show host could very easily bump in uh, an hour after the show and and grab all that audio and put it online. Okay. So is um you know I've I've dabbled using SoundCloud a, a little bit. Is that a really popular uh, place to to put bits like this that that you want to have easy, you know, easily link link to them? I'd say so. A lot of uh, a lot of companies are using their own websites and uploading their own audio, but uh, where there's a lack of that, uh, you know, they're using SoundCloud. That's one of the number one biggest platforms for uh, radio stations to be able to um, publish their audio and have it uh, be uh, have it listened to by your audience at a later date. Um, when so when you don't have your own your own thing, SoundCloud's a perfect. It's it's like the YouTube of audio, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's kind of what I thought. I, I, it, it seems like uh, what was it? Some months ago, there was some danger of uh, SoundCloud closing up operations or something. It's, it's something there was some scuttlebutt in the news, and now I guess it's all okay. Can I guess I'm just a little bit worried? I, I heard about me I'm not it a lose little bit. Yeah. No, yeah, okay. you wouldn't lose everything at, at the end of it. You can actually pull your audio back down from SoundCloud if uh, if it's there. Uh, so I, I wouldn't. They're a big enough company that I don't think you would lose everything. Um, I mm -hmm. don't think that they're going anywhere anytime soon at this point. They're uh, they're in good shape so far. They they don't have ads on the platform, um, so they they offer it as kind of a freemium uh, a freemium model where you do pay for a premium service um, uh, that mm -hmm. uh, that has a bit higher quality and a uh, bit faster loading times. Okay, so uh, Chris Tobin's back. Chris, so at your stations, do you guys do clips um, for podcasts, either whole shows or or short clips? Uh, no, no short clips. It's all, it's always one piece because they're, they're ah. music podcasts. So it's one complete interview and, you know, occasionally you edit in and out certain pieces, but that's about it. So, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned at my stations, we don't do any of this right now. Nothing we produce 
do we uh, keep on, you know, put up uh, for listening later on? Um, uh, what, what's your workflow at, at your stations, Chris? Is, is it, uh, it sounds like, you know, Curtis has got a really easy thing, but you've probably been able to streamline it some, somewhat for what you do. I guess I'm looking to compare uh, and contrast what uh, Curtis's program, Broadcast Logger, offers as far as just click, 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 publish, uh, compared to what other folks might be doing. If, if you've got a fairly easy process or is it, is it laborious? Uh, it's a fairly easy process. I mean, our podcasts are really tailored programs. They're, they we're not doing anything off the uh, air signal. Uh, it's they're all pre-produced. The uh, logger okay. product, okay. yeah, the logger product would work well if we were doing, say, other things with the air signal, but we're not. These are all pre-done shows. Okay, understood. Where logger, so, uh, where the logger really works really well is mm -hmm. uh, where it works really well is if you've got. Um, if you've got, uh, sorry, a live show that you're already pre-producing every morning, as you would typically find with a morning show, or uh, even with your afternoon hosts, your midday hosts, um, you can very quickly pull those bits that they've done and put them online. Um, yeah. And that's something that a lot of people are doing in FM music radio, where um, where it's not really long form audio programming; it's just more of your your hit music style radio, and uh, that's where that's where it really um, that's where it really excels is in that sort of format. Gotcha. Well, um, if it doesn't have it now on Broadcast Logger, would there be uh, the availability of, let's say I, I produce a local, news, a local news newscast uh, every day. And at my stations in Mississippi, we, we do. We produce a newscast. Um, it is, the stories are automatically shuffled and rearranged for playback. At, during, at different hours on different stations. It's all very automated. It's really cool. It ends up sounding like fairly fresh newscasts on each of our stations. Um, what if I would like to um, upload that automatically or crossload it from, from, from a broadcast logger? Uh, can I schedule any kind of, a, of an upload like that to SoundCloud? At the moment, no, you can't. But that's, uh, that's an interesting thing that you bring up because um, you... You, it, it, it would be fairly easy to uh, set up a schedule where it just looks for a particular tag or it looks yeah. for um, uh, some sort of metadata and then kind of grabs that w uh, when it's available and pushes it to uh, SoundCloud. So, no, it's not something we've built in of, um, being available yet, but it is something that, we, that wouldn't be hard to build in down the road uh, for that. And uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is we have a fully uh, – we're, we're developing a fully open API so that – uh, if other developers have ideas that they want to bring to the table and they want to integrate with Broadcast Logger, um, they can do that. Uh, one developer, one idea that we've had that we've been working with um, with a traffic platform is being able to pull the audio from every spot that airs automatically. So from within a traffic uh, system, you could very easily find the audio from each ad um, for, at the click of a button without having to worry about um, going into a separate platform. So uh, the engineer in me is a little bit curious about, all right, if my audio is going up into the cloud, the broadcastlogger.com cloud, um, should I worry the, in the least about what hardware it's going to? Is it hardware that I would even recognize or only an it's, IT uh, data center person would recognize? It's, it's all Amazon Web Services. Um, ah. We've uh, completely used Amazon Web Services. So everything from AWS uh, is, our, is our platform. They've got a, a great data storing system that allows us to uh, push audio directly to AWS very well. So, um, or they've got a great data st uh, storage system for long term as well. And, uh, and we've, we, we just utilize that. Um, we've kind of built our own platform on top of that. But at the end of it, um, we, they advertise to us a 99.9999999999 whatever there's like 10 nines in there uh percent uh, data data file durability and i think if you look at a full year of audio it equates to yeah. about 4 minutes of audio not being available um but uh, to this to, uh, to this date we haven't lost anything and um i believe they I, if i'm not mistaken they haven't uh, had many issues with it either down the road that's probably four minutes I didn't want anyway. So, yeah, exactly. It's two a.m. on a Sunday. So, uh, um, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I think I, I think I caught Hillary's cough. <laughs> That's what <laughs> I did. Um, so uh, the what was the gosh what was the last question? Oh yeah. So with the Amazon Web servers, the, uh, 
is, is this your own software that's running in that cloud? Is that how that works? It's, uh, yeah, it's a little bit. Uh, the platform itself and the API itself is our own software that we've written, and that's running on, uh, on servers uh, that we maintain. But the actual data store isn't our software. That's Amazon. It's a, a service called S3 that they offer. And, uh, and uh, Amazon S3 runs their own data storing software that we integrate. Uh, our APIs communicate directly with their APIs. Um, so okay. From the moment the audio gets recorded on your computer, it actually never touches our server. It goes directly into the Amazon data store from your facility. Um, uh, where uh. you're touching our server is with uh, the access applications as well as the, um, as well as the, uh, the metadata and the APIs that communicate with, the API, um, with us. So that's where that access... And then when we access that audio is when we do the cutting for you. Our servers download that audio, cut it up on our side, and, uh, and, put, and send it back to you as a, a single file. See, see if I recall that uh, Canada, uh, that's where you are. By the way, tell me where you are in Canada. Way on the West Coast, right? Uh, I'm on the, the most beautiful city in Canada, Victoria, B.C. Ah. We're, uh, like we're about halfway between Vancouver and uh, Seattle on an island. It's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, does you does your kind of logging that you're doing in the cloud, does that uh, qualify for any requirements that Canada may have for logging audio that for broadcasters? Yes, that's correct. It does actually. We uh, we require thirty days at the absolute minimum of uh, of audio, and if you're being investigated or if the CRTC requests it, you have to keep ninety days, uh, and that's all as a that's all conditional license. Like this is required. Um, some stations are required to keep longer for whatever reason. Um, so it, the, the way it works is uh, we have to keep that audio, and we do. Um, our system qualifies for compliance logging around the world. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to cough right over you. I thought I was muted. No worries. Sorry about that. So, hey, if we were logging this, we'd, we'd have that cough, too. Um, we would have that uh, cough, yes. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, there are plenty of other countries around the world, I know, because, hey, back some years ago when logging requirements you know, uh, came back to the fore, it seemed, uh, in, in, in law for a lot of countries, I know that uh, Telos ended up selling quite a few systems uh, to, to, to do logging. And of course, it was all local, local hardware, and uh, the idea of doing it in the cloud hadn't been invented yet. So, uh, Hey, uh, Chris Tobin, we're going to uh, break here in a minute for a, uh, a final tip uh, from Curtis, and maybe one from you. Do you have any uh, questions yourself? Okay. Any final questions for Curtis or, th or thoughts about this? No, you guys have been doing good. You're doing just fine. I'm just going to sit back and watch and listen. He's enjoying, right. he's enjoying his drink at the, uh, at, the, at the bar, the sports bar in New York there. I hear you, yeah. All right, well, you're listening or watching to This Week in Radio Tech, episode 320. Curtis Maycheck is our guest. He's the CEO of... Uh, Cloudcast Software, and they're the makers of BroadcastLogger.com. Our show is brought to you in part by the folks at uh, Axia and LiveWire Plus. LiveWire Plus now including AES67. Hey, let's take a look. Uh, I believe I provided a diagram, a link to a diagram, and I want to talk to you, show you how AES67 may help you in um, uh, connecting one studio to another. Whenever our producer can bring that diagram up, we'll take a look at that. There we go, right there. So in a typical audio over IP studio, uh, here's one that's live wire. You've got an Axia power station or, or perhaps a mix engine there uh, in the middle of things. Uh, or, or and of course, it's got an Ethernet switch built into it. You might have an Ethernet switch there if you don't use the power station. But everything uh, connects to that, right? Uh, you have a Zip1. You have a talk show system from Telos. You have some Axia X nodes. Uh, maybe you have an audio de uh, delivery PC with an IP driver. Uh, maybe you have a PC that's running broadcast logger, and uh, that's connected and, and ingesting audio from, from the system. You've got a few local sources and destinations that don't have networking, like a microphone. Or, or it could have uh, networking, actually. Uh, this diagram does show a, an AES-67. The, the blue dotted line uh, is showing AES-67 to a microphone. Now, Neumann does make a microphone that has AES-67. How about headphones? I don't know of any AES-67 headphones yet, so uh, you hook that up with a regular analog audio connection. Uh, you might have a CD player that's uh, AES-EBU. So you've got all these different connections. And uh, then you've got some Genelec speakers. They're, they're listed as control monitors and studio monitors uh, on the diagram over on the left-hand side. And the blue dotted line is showing us an AES-67 connection. 
Well, now all the consoles from Axia now include AES67 Direct compatibility. So that means you can plug those Genelec speakers, for example, uh, into directly into the switch on the back of an Axia power station or on the Axia Core, that's the Core 16 or the Core 32 uh, for our smaller consoles. That's what I was doing in, uh, uh, in, in California earlier this week. Plugged those speakers directly into the switch on the back of a Core 16 to demonstrate uh, its usefulness for AES-67. And so then you'll put a PC on the network and uh, use Bonjour to get right into those monitors and, and set them up through that Archwave Audio LAN uh, hardware and software combo. If you've got then another room, let's say over on the right-hand side of the diagram, the terminal room. So you've got um, live wire over gigabit going back to the Ethernet switch in the terminal room, and other studios may connect to that as well. But let's say that you've got a codec, and it's, well, it's not a Telos codec. It's from somebody else, but it does do AES-67. You just plug that into the same network as Livewire, and um, and you can get audio into and out of it, into your consoles, into and out of uh, Axia X nodes, for example. You can just do all that. And let's say that you know not every piece of Axia gear or Telos gear, not every piece is yet AES67 compliant or compatible. Uh, some items, it's just it's it's not a priority, or it's a little bit difficult to get that in there. You can use an Axia X node to do a conversion for you. So let's say that you need to get audio from that AES-67 codec, maybe record it directly into an audio delivery PC. No problem. You can actually route it through an Axia X node. And by the way, with the latest software in the Axia X nodes, you don't have to use up an input and an output. You know, that was a trick that a lot of folks uh, had done. They would just use a little short RJ45 cable and patch an input to an output and, and make a different stream. You don't have to do that anymore. Now, the Axia X node has built in routing, uh, mixing, and, uh, and conversion. You can take a, a live wire stream coming in, convert it to AES-67, and vice versa, and not use up any of the physical audio I.O. on the back of the X node. So, just a bunch of benefits come along with uh, the latest software from the Axia X node. And uh, there you go. That's, this is how you get connectivity with non-live wire devices on your network. Again, real confidence builder for those of you who are thinking about putting um, uh, audio over IP, whether it's live wire or perhaps some other brand, we hope it's live wire, in, into your facility. And uh, you, you've just got a, a whole world of connectivity uh, awaits you. Thanks to uh, the folks at Axia and LiveWire and now LiveWire Plus, which includes AES-67, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, uh, looking for a tip. And Curtis, you and I talked about this before the show. Uh, you know, we all live in our different worlds of uh, <coughs> favorite places, favorite tools, favorite uh, websites, uh, favorite tricks. What have you got to share mm -hmm. with us? We did. Well, I've, uh, I've got a, a couple buddies here in town, or not in town, rather, in BC, uh, that I've been working with. Uh, one of the guys, uh, his name's Joey. Uh, he's been building his own little uh, home studio. And uh, Bob, as well, uh, lives up uh, northern BC. Uh, and um, I think he's been on the show actually before, Bob Holowenko. But uh, we've been yeah, sure. we've been kind of experimenting, setting up our studios and trying to get audio between um, between the studios at a really high quality, uh, something that is comparable to a codec, for example. And uh, we found we stumbled upon this uh, this great little website. Um, I, you've probably heard of it, but uh, if you haven't heard about it, I want to tell you about it. It's called Clean Feed. And uh, you can find that just by Googling. I think it's cleanfeed.net, if I'm not mistaken. Let me double check. It is cleanfeed.net. So yeah, yeah, you just I've heard uh, of this, yeah. you sign up. It's free, and it uses um, the Chrome browser. What's really cool about it is uh, you're able to get broadcast quality audio links uh, from browser to browser very easily, very quickly. Um, it's kind of a quick and dirty way of um, of setting up a quick uh, audio link between two places, and we've been experimenting with that uh, with me and Joey and Bob just to, to have some fun, uh, have some fun comp uh, getting audio between our studios. It's been working really well. So uh, something to definitely look at if you if you need a quick and dirty. You know, you were talking. You've got step one, step or you've got plan A, plan B. Well, here's your plan C if you ever needed uh, if if you ever needed one. Um, to get audio from A to B, well, it's two-way, which is great. Uh, there's your plan C, is cleanfeed.net. 
you know, I was actually part of a beta trial of this, or I knew about it early, early on when it was in, in beta. And this does use, uh, you have to have the Chrome browser because it uses uh, the WebRTC framework, I believe, uh, to, uh, to make this happen. So it's from Chrome browser to Chrome browser. And, and you're right, if, if, you, uh, if you don't have a codec handy, you've got one built into your, to your laptop already uh, using the Chrome browser. This is not video, it's audio, but the audio uh, will audio, be as, yeah. Uh, yeah, as high quality as your connection will, will allow. Um, so, yeah, good, good idea. And it's pretty feet. automatic, too. It's, it's very yeah. automatic. Like, you don't have to, the con configuration is extremely low, um, the amount that's required. It's so easy to use. Cool. All right, cleanfeed.net. Thanks for, for that tip, Curtis. Uh, Chris Tobin, are you, you available? You got a tip for us this week? I have a, yeah, I'm here. I'm just a, a radio station just pulled up. I think they're going to do a broadcast shortly. So it's one broadcast ever know they're here at the uh, sports pub. <laughs> It's, it's fun. Um, yeah, my tip is a real simple one. It's, it's the usual labeling again. This week or yesterday, we had the national EAS test, and I had to uh, help a friend uh, over the phone instruct somebody to check their system. And oddly enough, even though you can tell them, look for the black panel box. This case was a DASDEC 2, the Monroe Electronics product. And it was difficult for the person to find it in the rack of equipment because a lot of panels are black. So... <laughs> even though you describe what the logo should be. So I, um, my suggestion, again, is label the equipment in the racks, even though you think people know what they are if you try to describe it. So I, I had them label it uh, EAS, encoder, decoder, uh, and a few other things. And thankfully, we tested the idea afterwards, later in the day. He had somebody else go up to the rack. It was a college station. And he went up to the rack and said, look for the e EAS, encoder, decoder. We need to check if the light is green or flashing red. Sure enough, within seconds, the student found it and had no problem selling us it was green. There was no alerts pending. And we're like, huh, look at that. A simple label saved us all that agony. So I'm going to repeat myself again as I have in the past. Be sure to label things in your studio or, if not, in the equipment room in the event of you not being there or someone of a technical background is not. But you do have a body. You just need to help them with a little guidance. So I'm going for the labeling. That is, uh, you can't mention that often enough, and you are so right. And we oftentimes, uh, at my station, we don't have an engineer on site, so I've got to talk to somebody on the phone. Go look for the Westwood One satellite receiver. Well, which one is that? There are five that look alike. Okay, it's the Good one luck. that now says Westwood One on there. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, like, that's like if you're an NPR station and you've got several NPR receivers. There is no logo on it, it's just they're all the same. So, yeah. Yeah, you want to definitely label them. And I've let me add on to your tip because labeling is key. One good, inexpensive way to label them is get a Brother P Touch labeler. They've been out for years and years and years. Uh, I've got an old one actually in the next room, and it works fine. But get a variety of the of of, of the labels. You know, get clear with black print. Cl get clear with white print. And th then you may want to get you know black over over white or white over black. Uh, so that you have some options for labeling so it can look nice. It doesn't have to look like a Dymo label maker. It can actually look almost like it was meant to go there. Clear with black and clear with white print, those cover many situations. Like if you're going to label the front of this DAS deck, which is dark, then you would use the clear with you know white lettering, and it's going to look really good when you label it EAS, you know, uh, encoder, decoder. So you can make it look good too. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Chris, any, any uh, I'm sorry, Curtis, any, any final word before we go? Thanks for being here, by the way. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. I've been looking forward to this uh, for a bit. All right. Well, good. Chris Tobin, uh, you know, have a great time there. I hope it works out well, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you next week. Yes, absolutely. Look forward to it. It should be fun. All right. Oh, by the way, speaking of next week, uh, our guest next week, a guy that we've had on before, uh, Dana Popolo, uh, he's always a controversial guy, but I'll tell you what, there's something that he knows really well and knows how to explain, and that is FM antenna tuning and why it's critical even for low power and translator stations. Uh, it's just as critical for them as it is for high power FM stations. So why should you sweep your antenna? You should never just throw up an antenna, plug it in and say, okay, uh, looks good, let's go. There are real benefits to getting that antenna tuned, and Dana will be here to tell us all about it on next week's episode of This Week in Radio Tech. I want to thank uh, all of our sponsors. Uh, be sure you check out our website, thisweekinradiotech.com. You can uh, subscribe to the feed there, either audio or video feeds there. You can do the same thing, if you like, at the GFQ website. So gfqnetwork.com, 
Uh, you'll find our podcast as well as many others there on the GFQ uh, website. Uh, be sure you patronize our sponsors and let them know that you heard about the show here. It really does help out. And uh, thanks also to Suncast for producing today's show. I really appreciate it. It went swimmingly well. And uh, we'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>